Welcome to The Engineering Room, a monthly series of long-form conversations with influential people from the software world. The Engineering Room series is sponsored by Equal Experts, and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. So if you'd like some help building some great software or are interested in finding a great place to work, do check their links in the description below. My guest today is one of the original authors and signatories of the Agile Manifesto. He's probably the reason why you heard, have heard of the programming language Ruby, which he popularized with his book, Programming Ruby. He named concepts that we all use frequently, like Dry and Code Carter, and he's a speaker, teacher, and author of many books, one of which is regularly in the list of most significant software books of all time, The Pragmatic Programmer. As well as being an author, he's also been a publisher with a roster of great books in his publishing house, The Pragmatic Programmers. I, I, but I think that at the heart, he still thinks of himself primarily as a programmer. Please welcome Dave Thomas. Dave, hello, say Dave. hello. I will say hello. Hello. Welcome. Um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. It was uh, great meeting you down in Australia uh, a few months back and even better meeting you now. We had a lot of fun in Australia. There's fewer beers this time, I'm afraid, at least for uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and right now for me, I mean, you've got like a six-hour head start on me. Uh, I'm, I'm in Dallas, and it's still morning for me here. But uh, uh, fair enough, a bit early to start. Uh, it is a bit. It is a bit. Hey, I'm gonna. I am going to to berate you just slightly here for sure. the introduction. Introduction, because you um, you said I was one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto. And yeah. as we all know, um, the calling it the Agile Manifesto is is basically what led to its death. Um, <laughs> I think, and I, I, this is just like a, a spurious thing, really. Now, but um, it is. <sighs> we talk about it like Agile is a thing, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a way of doing things. And so I think it's really important when we think about it not to think of it as the Agile Manifesto because that implies that Agile is something. Um, but it's really just the the manifesto for Agile software development and the focus the, the, is the, on... The, that, 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 common, that common failure of the computer industry, the nounification of verbs. Exactly right, yeah. <laughs> but the problem with nounification of Agile is it means people think it exists, right? Yes. And if it exists, then I could go out and buy it or I can get some consultant to show me what it is or, you know, I can say I'm doing it. And yeah. you can't you can't do any of those things, you know, any more than a ballet dancer can say, you know, um, I'm doing agile dancing, right? No, you're not. You're dancing with agility. And, yes. and there's, there's a massive difference, right? Because you cannot really teach. Fundamentally, you cannot teach agility. You can only learn it. Yeah, you know, and a, and a teacher will will help you by helping you create those feedback paths. You know, but at the end of the day, you can't go out and buy a pound of agility. <laughs> I th I think you probably can, but you shouldn't be able to. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. So I, anyway. I, I, I was no, I, no. This this is a good this is a good place to start. I I was going to start here anyway by you know, referring to one of your probably better known uh, blog posts, at least from a few a while ago, which was called "Agile is Dead: Long Live Agility," which which is clearly the same theme uh, here. And I, I reread that um, before talking to you today, and. Yeah, it was it rang true, and 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 to be fair, you know, you were saying this before it came became fashionable to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny from day one. Um, so we all left Snowbird, and honestly, nobody thought we'd done anything dramatic. Um, it was kind of like, yeah, that's kind of cool. We've actually come up with some agreement here, uh -huh. and I think we were all very uh, pleased. With the we prefer A over B formulation uh, yes. on the on the front page, um, and honestly, that was uh, kind of about it. And then Ward Cunningham contacted me uh, a week later or something, saying, "I'm putting together a website, and I'm not too sure how to handle to where people can sign up to say I agree with this." You know, mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, he said, you know, how, how am I going to handle the recording of the names? So uh, we jointly developed this kind of, I can't remember what it was, some kind of CGI script that did it. And um, it was unbelievable. He put that thing up and we had like a thousand signatures on the first day or something stupid. And then it just grew, you know, everybody says exponentially. In this case, it, re it really was exponential for a while. Yeah. Um, and it just took off, you know, and uh, I certainly couldn't believe it. I, I was just like, you know, where are people getting this from? And it was clear that it was like resonating with people, which was kind of cool. But then it started becoming uh, a business, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just external consulting companies, quite a few of the people actually in the manifesto. And, you know, I don't blame them for it because it's how they, they make their living, you know, but yeah. it turned into consulting practices and, and this kind of stuff. And it just, there was a conference. I mean, people started organizing conferences and I just don't see how you can have a conference about agility. You know, it's, it's, I mean, you could have a couple of demonstrations, but you can't really have a conference about it. Um, but no, there were conferences and they got bigger and bigger and, you know, more and more commercial. So yeah. I really have not been involved in that movement uh, post Ward Cunningham's website, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, now that's not to say I don't think it's important. I still think that the the values, the full values, are correct, um, yeah. and I think I think that they are uh, a good set of their guidance. You know, I mean, yeah. every value is a way of um, uh, filtering the decisions you make. Yeah, so yes. You have to do a, you know, you can say to yourself, well, I could do A or B. And you think about the consequences and then you think about your values. And yeah. it doesn't matter whether you're writing software or raising children, right? It's the same thing. And as such, I think they they work. I mean, I find myself using them still today when I'm yeah. trying to say, well, should I do it this way or that way? Um, but they're not rules, they're values. Right. It never yeah. says don't write documentation or whatever. You know, it's just if you emphasize this over that, then your life will get easier. You know? And and I, I, I think that's one of those things that trips so many people up when you've got these corporate interests that are selling training or whatever else, is that you know it starts to feel like a prescriptive set of instructions rather than a set of I suppose a kind of measurement, you know, where are you on this scale? And, you know, generally our advice is to prefer to be towards the left end of the scale rather than the right end of the scale. Right. But you know? there's another side to that too. And that is that fundamentally people, okay, this is, I'm going to get into trouble with this. Um, there's a lot of research that backs up the fact that when you are just starting out in something, when you don't actually have a, a experience with something, mm -hmm. then you need to be told what to do. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the first time you get into an airplane with an instructor, right, they're not going to say, okay, show me what you can do, right? No, yeah. they're going to say, okay, I want you to pull this, push that, whatever else, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's the same with software development. And so yes. a lot of people who are... Um, and on top of that, a whole bunch of people in software development have imposter syndrome, which means that they think that they're beginners even if they're not. And mm -hmm. so they also want to be told what to do. Yeah. And that is what's being capitalized on, right? So all of these people who are feeling, you know, I'm sure I'm not doing this right. Um, they are searching for rules. They are searching yes. for people to tell them, do this, then do that, do the other. And so here we have this website that has four apparent rules on the front page and no one ever got fired for doing agile. So therefore, you know, do these. Yeah. Um, and I, that's kind of the tragedy of it is they take 
what is a, I think, still a really, really valuable set of values yes. and convert them into a straitjacket. Yes, and, I, 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 I think in some ways there's, there's a tragedy on top of that tragedy, which I, I think is certainly true, is that people don't even look at the four values. They just go to, okay, I'm doing, I'm being agile if I'm following this ceremony, if I'm following mm -hmm. these, you know, these 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 conscripts the number of people that claim to be practicing agile development that i've i've introduced to the agile manifesto saying have you read this <laughs> are you doing these things uh, yeah is, is yeah. astonishing so yeah it's uh there's, there's a lot of tragedy around here uh yeah but you know what there's also a lot of good i mean yes i think it's i mean you remember what software was like at the end of the 90s right i yes. mean it was a total unmitigated disaster um yeah. you know i mean the the what was it i can't remember it was like 30 percent of projects or something stupid got completed yeah. um and if you look at the world today i think it's maybe i'm i'm just like looking through the wrong colored glasses but it looks to me like we've got a lot lot better at developing yes. software you know yes. you know i think you go into a project now expecting you know, modulo weird management shifters, you, you expect mm -hmm. to get it finished and working, you know, yeah. and that that is radically different to the mindset 20 years ago, 25 years yes. ago. Um, and I think part of that's tooling. Um, but I think some of that is also the idea of the ideas behind agility and, and yes. getting out of this, you know, requirements, design, architecture, blah, blah, kind of yeah. mindset. Um, I, 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 I agree with that entirely. I think we've made, I think we've made enormous progress. I, uh, and I, I do think that agility is part of it. I, I confess, I, I, I think that, I think of, I think of agility as it's normally seen and practiced as a really deeply important step. I don't think it quite goes the whole way. I, I, I think that the, the culture of uh, forgive me uh, misusing the the terms in your framing but but of the agile movement i think the right. culture of, of of the agile movement is of um no i don't think it's quite prescriptive enough i don't think it's good enough at ruling out stupid ideas so i think that there are dumb ideas there are things that simply don't work as you said 25 years ago if you'd asked most certainly large organizations how to build software they'd have all said waterfall and yeah. that's just wrong it doesn't work it's, it, you know it, it never really works the only way that a waterfall project has ever worked in as far as i've ever seen is where people cheat the process because the process doesn't help it just gets in the way so agile was a vi seems to me was a vitally important step to get us onto a a saner footing in terms of let, let's just start organizing work about trying things out and seeing what works and dropping the things that don't work and keeping the things that do work and and you know that kind of idea of inspecting and adapting and reflecting and you know growing our ability to change maintaining our ability to to change our minds change our systems change direction seems to me a foundational concept certainly in what i talk about and i think from reading the things that you talk about similarly for you um, absolutely absolutely then yeah. you know that seemed to be a huge step an enormous step forward that people that didn't actually live through the late 90s and and before in terms of what software development practice was like probably don't understand the impact that this had i had somebody recently on social media saying that that nobody ever did waterfall well <laughs> yes yes they did and it didn't yeah. work right yeah. Although, so, but I got to take a little exception there because sure. I don't think there are uh, a priori dumb ideas. Okay. Like, and I don't think necessarily that waterfall is bad, right? Or mm -hmm. let's put it this way I don't have evidence in the current world that waterfall was bad. Okay. Um, what I think is what you said about change and uh, having the courage to experiment. Yeah. Uh, I think a whole part of agility that people forget is that agility applies 
to itself, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to be willing to experiment with your practices yeah. in order to say, yeah, this is good, this is bad. Um, so rather than say waterfall is bad, what I would be interested to see is, okay, I think waterfall is bad, but I don't know. So I'm going to do this next project waterfall and see what mm -hmm. happens, you know? And yeah, of course that might get you sued and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, you would learn something along the way, you know? And so I don't, but as soon as people start saying dumb ideas, then it kind of strikes me as being dangerous because we could throw a very, very attractive baby out with that both bath water if we're not careful. Um, one of the examples I had about that, um, so I have been testing, unit testing, since 1980 sort of thing. Um, automated tests, part of my blood, blah, blah, blah. And I got really upset uh, with people around about 2008, 2009, who turned into test Nazis. Mm -hmm. And they were doing things like, well, I'm not accepting your code because it doesn't have 100% coverage, you know? Um, and they became really, really obnoxious. And they mm -hmm. were, it's, it was religion. You know, it's like you have to have 100% coverage and you have to do this and that and that. So I used to test a lot and I thought, okay, let's see what happens if I stop testing. So I did. And I ran for, I don't know, four, six months, something like that, uh, without writing a single test. And at the end of it, my code, as far as I could tell from things like bug frequency, my code was identical to the code it was before. Um, and part of that, I think, is because I had been writing tests so long that I'd kind of internalized a lot mm -hmm. of the benefit of testing. So when I was writing my, my actual code, I was always thinking, how would I test this? Yeah, And that was driving APIs and it was driving decoupling and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't actually need the tests for that. Um, I also found that not having tests actually made me way more agile when it came to making changes. Because I'm sure everybody's had this thing where, you know, you, you make what is on the surface a fairly small change and you end up breaking a hundred tests, mm -hmm. you know? So um, at the same time, I think tests are a useful safety net uh, for some things. So my current strategy is that I will typically write some tests, particularly for things which are either tricky or that I want to explore. Mm -hmm. And then typically I'll delete them once yeah. I finish that section of the code. And so I'm not carrying the baggage. If there are ones that are kind of like foundational, I'll keep those in, but they'll be very rare. Um, but that's just an example, I think, because, you know, that would fail me every single job interview that I went to, <laughs> you know, because obviously, obviously you have to have tests. Obviously it's important to have tests, right? And that's just pure received information. That's no, not based on any kind of experience or experimentation or anything. Um, uh, so so I, I, I think I disagree with you slightly on, on, on that one. So, so I, I don't think that I'm a test Nazi. Certainly I'm not going to, reject anybody's code because of certain levels of coverage and, and, and so on. Uh, I, I was going to ask you when you started describing your experiment with dropping tests, whether you thought that was because of the things that you'd learned from testing before, because I've had a similar experience. If I write code these days without writing tests, which is fairly unusual, but if, if I do, my design is still influenced by... <laughs> the kinds of design choices that I would make in order to make my code testable. And, and for me, that's one of the values. So, uh, like you, it's one of the comments that I often get about test driven development, I, I suppose I'm probably thought of as a fairly hard line promoter of test driven development because I am. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's an important tool in the box. But somebody asked me recently whether I thought that test-driven development was an essential component of continuous delivery. And I said no. And I think I surprised them. I think I think it's a really good idea. And I think for most teams, I would recommend very strongly that you practice continuous deliver delivery. But can you do continuous delivery without test room development? Yeah, you can. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're not they're not essential parts of the same thing. So, well, so, uh, so the other sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, presumably though, for you, for continuous delivery, you would want to have integration level tests. Yes. So what you're what you're talking about here is more the the bread and butter, you know, test every function type tests. So 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 I tend not to think of it in those terms. So I think of it more in terms of the cycles that are interesting. So so I want a fast cycle to support the development process, and primarily, I think to do what you were talking about. So I want insight into my design choices is one of the big pieces of value. So mm -hmm. um, so I particularly when I'm exploring or, or experimenting, I use tests then because that's what tells me that my design's starting to smell. If you know, and if I'm nervous of wanting to change my code and it breaking hundreds of tests, that's probably a warning sign for me that my design sucks. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to be looking for other ways of organizing the design to be less prone to that risk. Um, yeah, no, I, I, that's valid. That's valid. Yeah. But the other thing, the, the other thing that I'd want to pick up on and really yeah, yeah. strongly agree with you on is um, the idea of, you know, trying things out. You know, when, when you discuss, so, so I wasn't, I wasn't dismissing, I don't think I was water, dismissing waterfall out of hand. I've tried it. I've tried it more oh, yeah. than I want to, and I don't believe it works for software development. I think it works well for other things, clearly, because Waterfall's kind of a production line, and production line work really nicely for some kinds of things when you've got a repeatable process. But I, I don't think it works well for software development. And I'll be fine with, I don't want to do it anymore, but I'll be fine with people doing the experiment again. And I agree with you that we shouldn't be dogmatic and dismiss any idea without without evidence trying it out beforehand so i'm not saying that ideas a priori are you know some ideas are done without trying them but i think that once you've tried them you can say that's a bad idea oh yeah but i think also when you say it's a bad idea you always always have to qualify it with for me I, because... I, so I'm, I, I'm not sure that's true so 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 you know the earth isn't flat and so that's just factually incorrect. And I think well, that there are yeah, ideas like that. Okay, but that's not an idea. That's a fact. Okay. What we're talking about here is process. We're talking about about things that work for you. Yes. Okay. And what tends to happen is, oh, God, I get so, so sick of this, right? As a publisher, uh, I see this a lot. People have a successful project, right? Often to their own surprise. Yeah. And they think, Oh, we just worked out how to write software. I'm going to write a book about that, yeah. you know? And they write, we, we call that the what I did on my summer vacation book. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people go out and they write that, expecting it to take the world by storm because this is the way to write software. Yeah. And the reality is, no, that is the way you wrote software with one particular team, one particular domain, one particular set of tools, one particular client, and that is never going to work again. Now, something you may learn lessons from it that can be applied, but there is no set of rules that will be universal for this, you know? And so I think whenever you talk about practices, whenever you talk about, quote, methodologies, yeah. it always, always is contextual, right? You always have to say, for me, in my circumstances. Right. Um, for example, waterfall. Um, the fundamental reason that water, well, first of all, Royce's original waterfall was not the waterfall that we're talking about. Right. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so, what his original waterfall was full of feedback loops. Um, yeah. But uh, organizations that adopted waterfall 
decided the feedback loops were a waste of time and they just went for, you know, specify everything up, up ahead. The documents, and, the, the diagram on page two was easier, more consumable than the diagram on page 15. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah. But, but, but the reason waterfall doesn't work is that in a typical project, we don't have enough knowledge at the start. Yeah. And so a lot of the uh, goal of uh, the practices that we have is gaining knowledge and then applying yes. that back to what we do. Yes. However, if I was writing software, which I would never do, uh, for a pacemaker or mm -hmm. the autopilot for a plane, maybe, or something of that ilk, then I would not do it the way I write current software, right? Because I would need everything laid out up front, right? I would put down I would have every single I crossed and T dotted, you know, because it would be, it's not the kind of thing you can learn post delivery, if you like. Right. And so I, I was, I, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in that because I, because I, 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 I work in environments that are a little bit close to that sometimes. And I'm not sure that I agree. Well, no, I'm being polite, being too polite. Sure. I don't agree. <laughs> so, so, so I think, I think that, I, I think that, um, I, 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 I'm one of my hobbies is, is science. I, I'm an avid reader of science and physics and those uh -huh. sorts of things. And I think that, you know, a sensible take, a reasonable definition of modern engineering in any context is kind of the practical application of kind of scientific style rationalism to solving problems and and it's not the same as science but it's kind of using similar kind of rational approaches to problem solving and i don't think i don't think that even in safety critical systems maybe even particularly in safety critical systems you can know all of those things up front sure you do the diligence to try and be you know to try things out as safely as you can but you still try things out and you can look at this you can look, kind of look at this on bigger timelines so if you look at the history of the aeroplane early aeroplanes were death traps and now they're incredibly safe that happened through learning iterative learning over a century and the yeah, engineering how, 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 grew did and evolved learning, over... how did that learning take place the Lots learning took well quite a learning lot by killing people exactly right exactly yeah. right and that is the, i mean there's a glenn vandenberg has a really great talk about bridge building mm -hmm. and um he uh he has a quote and I, will, I won't get this right but basically his take on engineering is that what you're looking at is applying rational thinking within constraints yes and the constraints, one of the major constraints is budget. And so yeah. engineers are driven to design things basically cheaper and cheaper. Um, yeah. And what happens is like with bridges, I mean, the early bridges, I mean, we still have bridges built by the Romans, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're basically solid stone um, and not much is going to happen to those until they erode. Um, yeah. But then what happens is people discover the arch and then, hey, guess what? We can use less stone. And then they discover that you don't actually have to fill the middle bit in and we can get away with less again. And it keeps getting less and less and less until we get something that suddenly falls down. Yeah. And they look at that and they go, ah, I think we took that too far. You know? yes. And history is full of engineers who take things and push them to the limit and then push them just that little bit too far and learn from it and then yes. go back and do it again. That is, I think, kind of a model for what we're doing now. But knowing that, then I think that we apply a different set of constraints to safety critical stuff because the, the constraints that we have currently are to some extent like, you know, it doesn't matter, we'll fix it in post. You know, we can we can deliver this software and 
we know it's probably got a couple of bugs in it, and but that's okay because we are agile, damn it, and we can fix it. Um, and that's true. And that's how you get things out the door at all. I mean, you cannot 100% test any piece of software before you ship it. And you don't have to because unless people's lives are online, right, it's you accept the fact that it's going to have holes in it and you accept the fact that you're going to have to fix it at some point. Um, so, so, so I, 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 I certainly, I certainly agree with that. But I, I think that this is one of the the places where I think of the stuff that I talk about it as, in some ways, a, an extrapolation of agile thinking rather than a, a wholly, you know, classically agile movement. I'm not talking about moving fast and breaking things. I'm talking about mo making progress in small incremental steps and okay. being really cautious yeah. about the steps. Hmm. Right, but okay, so what is the filter by which you measure the success of a step? I if think you... that's that's contextual depending on the nature of the change, but certainly for for safety critical things, you're going to do everything that you can to make sure that the change that you release is safe, but you can never know up front. There is always that that uh, that, that possibility even likelihood that at some point one of these things will be a misstep that's always true whatever the yeah, process yeah, yeah. it's just yeah, the think, sca yeah. scale on which you decide to take the risk and my thing is that the making the making those steps small and simpler reduces the risk overall and, and i think you can look at you know the success of tesla and spacex and those sorts of play you know engineering approaches you know, taking place. You know, the, you know, Tesla is evolving its cars dynamically on the production line all of the time. You know, it's mm -hmm. they're not kind of one model that's relatively static, and then you churn them out like cookie cutters. Right, but then again, SpaceX. There was a good reason why their first fourteen flights were not manned. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, yeah, you know, and that's that's. I guess, I guess, I think we're violently agreeing here. Um, I think we probably are. I think what I'm talking about in let's think how to express this. I think um, I think actually it's in, even in the pragmatic program we talk something about this of the idea of establishing semantic invariance, the idea of establishing upfront the boundary conditions of your code, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Putting in place um, monitoring. Okay, so if I am doing if I'm doing say um, a pacemaker, then I probably want to do all sorts of all sorts of rules about you know how quickly I can change the rate, what the maximum mm -hmm. rate is, what the minimum rate is, blah 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 blah. I don't I have no idea how pacemakers work, um, and those to me would be established upfront. And would be parameterized into the code, not as numbers, but as like you know, rules that the code has to obey. Yeah. And to me, that would count as being a part of a specification that wasn't discovered as we went along, but was uh, extracted up front, right? And yes, there will be more things that happen during testing that you say, oh, and we forgot about this and we forgot about that. But yeah. without at least a culture of having these invariants set at the front for certain kinds of code, then I think you risk all sorts of problems. Um, if we had those invariants on the Mars lander where it was like the old you know, metric versus imperial order it was, um, then they would probably have found that during testing. Mm -hmm. um, if I was doing a system that dealt with money, I would want to build in invariance to say that, you know, uh, you can't make money. <laughs> well, is that is that? Yeah, but no, but like, um, you know, an invoice cannot be less than a penny, or cannot yeah. be more than you know what's reasonable for my business, um, and all those kind of things. I think are important to think about upfront, as mm -hmm. opposed to discover. Because, like I say, I think it sets a culture for the code, uh, a, a an expectation for the code as you go along. I am not saying you specify it down to the, you know, then module A does this, you know. But what I am saying is you have to think of the contract 
that your code has with the real world. Yeah, I, I, I think I think I think the thing that we're both saying, and I think implicitly agreeing with one another on, is that you need to be thoughtful about these things, and you need to be thinking about, you know, what's our best understanding of the problem and our solution to that problem right now and we want to try and have that model and i would if if that's what you're saying and i think it is then i'd agree with that completely but i yeah, think you're uh, taking i think you're going a little bit further because 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 i think i think also your 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 influence and your background involves sort of contract based um development and um, i'm talking about some of that sort of stuff as well well, yeah, but not it didn't involve it because it it evolved because I discovered it was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I I I think uh, like when I was at college, um, uh, we learned back then the idea of being able to uh, do theorem proving on your code was like mm -hmm. a big, big a big deal, and so we learned all about how to do you know uh, Dijkstra style you know, back propagation of truth back through code and yeah. loop invariance and all that kind of stuff. Obviously never came to anything, but I got to tell you that thinking about a loop invariant makes it a whole lot easier to write a loop, particularly when they're complicated. Yeah. Um, and so um, I think that there is an element of, there is a danger with test-driven development um, and It kind of started out with some of the XP stuff, right? Where it would be write a failing test, then write the code to fix it. Mm -hmm. And the first test you would write would typically uh, instantiate an object of a class that didn't exist yet. And then you go, yeah. oh, now I need the class, right? Um, and the problem with that is that your horizon was always two minutes ahead. And I have seen teams disappear up their own asses just because they only they're following such a small increment every single time they're forgetting where they're going you know it's kind of like going for a walk but only looking two inches ahead of you at every step right you're not going to end up where you want it to be now i know that's extreme and i know i'm, I'm pushing it a bit but i think that there's a lot of i mean do you remember did you ever follow the um Ron Jeffrey's Sudoku puzzle thing. Um, I, I, I've seen it. I know what you're talking about. So, yeah, because he was going to test drive the development yeah. of a Sudoku player, right? And he got nowhere because yeah. he got stuck in this rabbit hole of, you know, some kind of how do I represent the board, you know, and yeah. test driving that and totally forgot about the fact that you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to test driven development come up with, you know, some kind of min max optimization or whatever else, right? Yeah. There are techniques you actually have to know. Um, and so I think that it's perfectly okay to do some thinking up front. It's perfectly okay to do some research up front. And it's personally, uh, perfectly okay to set some um, boundaries up front rather than just jumping first thing. Day one, write a failing test. Oh, so, 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 uh, so the first thing I should say is that I'm in 100 percent agreement with that. Uh, I think that the that the, the slight nuance. I think so. I I I, I think um, I, I'm I'm a big fan of the uh, of Kent Beck's Extreme Programming book and was uh -huh. an, an early adopter of Extreme Programming. Um, and I think that the, the the weakness, and I always thought this, the weakness was talking about design. It, it doesn't really talk about design, talks about, you know, you know, design, you know, having a metaphor for the design and that kind of stuff. And I don't think that was enough. So I, I agree with you. I want to have a mental model of the system in mind that I'm able to refine and adjust and, and modify as I learn more and adapt more, and that guides my broader picture design thinking. So, so I'm, I've never been against thinking and you know drawing things on whiteboard, and even occasionally drawing drawing the odd UML diagram to if it helps me to better understand a problem. Um, 
So I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's you're right. It's a common failure mode of um, some teams to try and have, um, <clears throat> narrow the focus too much. And I, mm -hmm. I, 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 th I think that that's definitely a problem. So I, I think that you need, you know, something else to be able to steer those sort of, that, that sort of broad brush, brush design. H how do you go about that part of the problem? I kind of attack it from both ends. Um, so right now, for example, I'm in the middle of trying to put together um, something I've been thinking about for four or five years, um, which is a kind of a uh, new style um, of learning management system. And it has way too many moving parts right now. Um, and it's going to be using a lot of technologies that uh, are fairly new and I want to make sure that I'm not just jumping onto a bandwagon and you know developing on something that will be obsolete two years from now. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually attacking it from two sides. Uh, in my office, I have a couple of sheets of A0 paper or whatever size it is um, pinned up on the wall, and I'm drawing lots and lots of boxes and lines and arrows on that, um, yeah. trying to work out... Uh, I actually have different styles of boxes. I have function boxes. Uh, oh, I have fun sorry. I have diagrams that talk about function. And I have diagrams that talk about data. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, my biggest issue is data architecture, where things live and for how long and why. Um, so I do that, and then at the same time, um, I am right down in the low level, trying stuff out. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I'm looking at different database technologies and how they would how they would apply. And so the two things are feeding each other. So like I'm doing a data diagram and I suddenly realize, hey, it would be really useful if the central store could send events out to people, right? So then I got to go and say, okay, so how would that work in practice? And I got to look for various databases that would give me that and see what the constraints that they would then put on the rest of the system. Um, so I'm kind of iterating from both ends. Um, and I'm writing a whole bunch of code that I know I'm going to throw away. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, have you ever watched like a, a conductor in front of an orchestra, right? And they will bring everybody to silence and then they'll raise their batons up in the air and then they will pause. And at some point, there'll be just the right moment for them to start, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you don't know how, you don't know exactly what it is that triggers that. Um, and for me, at some point, my brain will go, okay, you've you've played around enough, now get and do it. And at that point, I'd be happy that my subconscious understands the problem. I may not mm -hmm. understand it fully, but I'll know that my subconscious does and that it will be guiding decisions I make. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess the answer to the question is, uh, up front, I am basically feeding myself as much information about the domain and the problem as I can, um, just so that my my subconscious brain starts to build intuition about what it is I need to do. And, and what what sorts of heuristics do you use to kind of guide that kind of learning? Do you have any of those sorts of rules of thumb? that help you, you know, just navigate the territory to help you to try and synthesize that, 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 that overview um, of the system. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, one is keep a journal, mm -hmm. uh, because if you keep a journal, it means you write stuff down. And if you write stuff down, it means it's entering your brain in a different way. Uh, and so it reinforces the, the, um, the intuition by doing that. Yeah. Uh, I have a um, time limit thing. Um, so depending on what I'm looking at, um, I'll give myself an hour or a day um, on various technologies. Um, any other rules of thumb? Oh, 
uh, I am really, really, really bad at. Um, I like problem solving. You know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. one of my my little things. And so sometimes when I'm investigating a technology, I'll come across some kind of rough edge. Um, so I'm using some library or whatever, and I'll notice that hey, that could be done better. And invariably, I find myself wasting an entire day generating a PR, you know, to submit to them. It's like, no, no, that's not what you're doing, right? You're supposed to be teaching yourself about this. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to get better about not doing that. Um, I noticed like at beginning, the end of last year, I had a string of about two or three PRs a week I was generating for different yeah. projects. And it's like, no, I mean it's it's okay. It's nice to give back, but right now what you're doing is you're trying to learn, and you know, yeah. let's focus on that. Um, I think it works differently for different people, but I am a really, really strong believer in uh, expertise. Really, is another way of saying that you don't have to think about something. That it's it's like okay, so you do you do your flying, right? Mm -hmm. If you had to sit there and think about every single motion that you make, uh, if you had to think about, you know, how your how your plane is flying, why it's flying, what it's doing, right, you'd fall out of the sky. Right. Instead, yeah. what you're doing is you practice and you practice and you practice, so that your brain instinctively knows, you know, when to stop a roll. Yeah. Right? And and. I was listening. I was watching one of your videos, and you were sitting there, and you were watching the video, and you were criticizing it. You know, yeah. oh, there was a bit, of, a bit of a bounce at the end of that one, right? <laughs> and what you're doing is you're feeding by giving yourself feedback, even after the event, you're feeding that subconscious part of your brain that knows yeah. how to do a snap roll. Yeah? yeah. And so then later on, you can just say to yourself, "Okay, snap roll, boom," and it that happens. You know? Yeah. And that's. That I think is the basis of all expertise. It is whether it comes to catching a ball or walking or talking, all of these things we cannot perform with our conscious brain. And yeah. so when we're writing software, part of our job is to internalize the process of writing software so that all the low level details get done for us. Now, we're about to become, that is about to become untrue. Uh, because things like Copilot are actually kind of taking that over. But um, I still feel very, very strongly that um, as developers, we try to control the process too much. Yeah. And what we should be doing is uh, developing the expertise that it kind of controls itself. That kind, that kind of goes, that kind of goes back to the thing that you said earlier, which is about you know, um, people early in their learning are want more rules. They, they want exactly. more, more structure. So, yeah. so, 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 if you'll forgive me, I, I, I asked a question amongst my Patreon community about uh, a, a, any questions for you, and th there's there's a perfectly relevant one at the moment. So, if you were tasked with designing a computer science program at university. How would you structure it to try and start people on the journey to develop the kind of expertise that you're talking about? How much freedom do I have? <laughs> <laughs> You've okay, got I, complete I, freedom. I, because oh, because... <laughs> wow. All right. So on day one, every student brings in a lump of gold. Now, um, so I actually, that's a really interesting question. And I actually did experiment with that. So I've had... Um, some beliefs about university education of computer science for a long, long time. And I had no uh, factual basis for it. So I contacted a local university and said, hey, I, I'll, I'll teach some classes for you because I wanted to mm -hmm. see what was actually really going on. Um, and so I'm a little better informed about that than I was previously. If I was designing... A university program, I would first of all say, who is it for? Right? Is this for people who want to become programmers, or is it for people who want to become computer scientists? Mm -hmm. Um. In the same way, so my son went to Embry Riddle, which is an aeronautical college, yeah. and they they have two 
effectively they have two programs. One of them is the um, flying side of it, which involves a whole bunch of you know engineering and everything else, but the focus is flying. And the other side is the engineering side, where the focus is the science. Um, and I would say the same thing applies to com uh, computer uh, education. Mm -hmm. I think for people who want to learn computer science, then the current course structure, although remarkably tedious, is probably not a bad place to start. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people that teach at university have never been paid to program in their lives. They have no idea what programming actually is. Um, yeah. I was dealing with fourth year students who had never ever been shown what a test was. Yeah. Um, when I told them to write tests, I got code that output strings of ones or zeros, and then was told that it was working if the pattern was one 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 zero zero one zero one one. You know, um, I had. I mean, honestly, they had no idea. They've probably never written a program more than fifty lines long in their entire yeah. time there. Um, so what I would do is I would, first of all, say I don't believe that computing is, should be an engineering, sorry, a academic discipline. Mm -hmm. I think the ideal way to learn programming would be an apprenticeship. Yeah. So how would I structure a course along those lines is I would give people, and I'd have to sit down and work it out on, you know, exactly but give them maybe six months of the basics yeah yeah what is binary what is a computer what is programming how to use source control how to write a test and then i would arrange for a year of outplacement where they would basically be interning um yeah. in the real world and the reason for that is that Anything you try to teach them about software development is solving problems that they don't even know exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you say to them, oh, it's it's a good idea to test, or it's a good idea to use version control. And that's just pure theory. That's just pure words, right? It's an algebra yeah. you're teaching them. But if they go out in the real world and discover, oh, God, I just messed up my code and I can't get it back, well, that's yeah. actually, you know, that's a lesson they have to learn. So send them out for a year bring them back in again, and then teach them uh, some of the theory behind some of the practices they were doing. So this would be when you would be talking about you know, feedback and thinking about mechanisms of getting feedback. You'd be talking about um, large-scale, or not large-scale, design overview kind of stuff, the ideas of coupling and, yeah. and dependency injection, all this kind of stuff, right? You'd be teaching them... Um, you would you would be teaching them that there are many kinds of programming and they all work together and you need to learn them all. You you can't just sit there and say I'm an OO programmer. And yeah. then I would send them out again um, for another year, and then finally I would bring them back in and I would have a final wrap up year or whatever on basically tying everything together and mm -hmm. setting them up. Um, developing the habits of uh, working in teams and of learning continuously. Yeah. Uh, that would be my kind of program for, for um, basically a guided apprenticeship. An, yeah. an apprenticeship. So, so, we, we, we did that at one of the places that, that I worked. We, we, decided, we were doing something quite difficult. We were building a very high performance system and we decided that we were going to hire people that we knew personally and trusted and wanted to work with and we were going to hire young people straight out of university and then try and brainwash them into the, our way of working right. and we, we kind of we kind of did it with pair programming and test driven development and all of those sorts of things and i'm very proud that we we helped to get several young people uh, on a really good footing of you know being being really good software developers that way i i, I agree with you entirely in, t in terms mm. of you know you need to it, it's it's a learn by doing kind of exercise it, I, I this might be rather highfalutin but but i i think it's rather it's rather like surgery you don't learn, learn surgery 
in an academic sense you you learn it by learning the you know the the, mm-hmm. the 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 academic things and then going and practicing it and trying out under close supervision of somebody that's done it before right exactly and, right exactly you know, right yeah but I, I suppose that's a difficult thing to do with the the explosive growth of you know programming and the relative shortage of um old duffers like you and me with some ex- you know some experience but um but uh, but you know you certainly need that 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 helping hand in early early in your career i think and i think okay this is where i am going to sound like the you know boring old fart but i think uh you and i both recognize that we have a duty maybe mm-hmm. to pass on some of the lessons that we've learned yeah um and so you know you do it like this and in other ways i do it through books and courses and stuff yeah but i think the idea of i have this theory that every seven years software reinvents itself and goes through exactly the same mistakes it made seven years ago and seven years before that um and I think if we're going to break out of that cycle, the only way to do it is for people to start to understand that they are not the first people to think of this yes. and to actually understand some of their heritage. Yeah. Um, one of the shocking things to me is it's, I think I've come across one university program that actually teaches the history as one of their classes. Yes. You know, and I think people would be shocked to know that you know in 1955 there were programming languages that had way better metaprogramming facilities than anything available today that had yeah. you know um continuation based development all that kind of stuff they had vectorization in the early 60s uh all of this kind of stuff that's been around forever um yeah. and people just think oh look at this this would be a really good idea if we did this well yeah it was back 40 years ago <laughs> um so I and that makes me sound like a real old fart, and I really hate doing it, but I really think it's important if you are to be effective, then the stronger the platform you can build from, the, the you know the deeper the foundation you have, the taller you can build. Yeah, it's it, it's it's that building on the shoulders of giants, you know, building on the learning of what what went before, rather than just reinventing or or, or even worse, just falling into the same problems that have already been solved. Um, yeah, right. yeah. certainly let's let's move on a little bit because I, I you know you you talk one of the things that you talked about um uh, before we started was um some of the stuff that you've been looking at about immutability and the impact of um if i can quote you back to yourself one of the things that you said was that uh, OO programming doesn't lend itself to large-scale distributed environments and that you think that immutability is a key tool. So could you just expand on that a little bit? Sure. Okay. So immutability means that once you've created a chunk of state, you cannot change that state. Um, And when you think about it, most of the hard problems to do with distributed systems or even just parallel systems in general is to do with state, right? Mm -hmm. How do you manage state? How do you keep state uh, consistent? How do you handle um, people joining and leaving um, a network of nodes? Um, All of these kind of issues are really, really complicated and are, I think, still being explored. There has not come up yet any kind of definitive, this is how we handle mutable state in a distributed system reliably. Mm -hmm. Um, So the functional world says, okay, then don't mutate state. And in the functional world, they say, once you've created a piece of state, then that's a fact, right? You can't change it. It's there. All you can do is you can... Uh, create a copy of it with changes. And then you've got some new state, but you've still got the old state. And the um, the benefit of that is that you are never going to get into these situations where two people have a different view of state because mm-hmm. the state is, is fixed. Okay, 
But then it takes it further because in a distributed environment, it allows you to have multiple consistent copies of state that you can choose to merge if you want to or choose to keep separate if you want to. Um, so in the OO sense, think of a database, right? A database is like a big object. And mm -hmm. so you open a database connection. I give you back some kind of magic handle to the database, which is an object pointer. And then you've got billions of methods you can call on this, insert, replace, whatever, right? And they are all mutating state. And to make that work, you have to have all of this transactional crap built in and no one gets it right. So imagine if instead of having an object come back when you connect to a database, you instead get a, a, a state ID that represents the current state of the data in the database at that time, okay? And it's a snapshot. So you now have a snapshot of that database immutable. You can read it to your heart's content. You can go get an updated version if you really want to, or you can update it yourself, at which point you created a new snapshot. And if you want to pass that snapshot to other people, then they will take that snapshot on too. And so suddenly we don't have issues of concurrency. We don't have issues of um, trying to maintain uh, a unified vision of this data. Um, instead, we just have code that manages state as a uh, ongoing process. All right, it's all sort of lamp or clocks or whatever it is that manages it. That, and added to which, the nice thing about that is that you can be mutating your state locally offline or whatever else, and then when you join back up again, we'll merge that back in if necessary, if we want to. And similarly, changes that were made externally can get merged back into my state, creating new state. But it means that you, you never, ever have referential integrity issues because your state is self-contained. And assuming it started out referentially integrated, that you cannot change that. It will always be good. So I think that's one aspect of it. Data immutability, I think, is critical when we're talking about dynamic, unreliable networks of, of processes. Um, there's another really cool thing that I only just came across last year which is immutable code. So and I came across this in the Unison programming language, and it's probably existed before, but I'd, I'd not seen it. So Unison does not have source code. Um, it has an internal representation, which is a bit like the small talk idea of the image, right? So yeah. it has this data structure that represents um, code. And then you can prime that data structure by feeding into it source code, which is totally ephemeral, which is all it's used for is to get stuff into that data structure. If you want to change it, you can ask it to export a particular whatever, make a change and put it back in again. That data structure is immutable. So if I make a change to a function, then it gets stored as a different function. And the original one is still there. The actual internal name for all of these functions is a hash of the AST for that function, which means that if I write a function uh, that adds two numbers and you write a function that adds two numbers, even if they're called different things and they have different uh, variable names inside and everything else, if they have the same AST, they're the same function. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we won't, we won't store it twice. It'll just give it both the same. Now, imagine then that I, uh, I use this function in some of my other code. So in my code, it looks like I'm calling sum. But what I'm really calling is the hash of the function that's known as sum at the time I've written that code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when that all gets loaded into the big image, into the big data structure, then that code becomes, I am not calling sum, I am calling the function whose hash is whatever it is, some big long number. So then some other wag comes along and changes the sum function so that now it subtracts its first argument from its second argument, right? 
and they store that into the global repository of code. Ha ha, yeah. they think, I've just broken the world's economy. <clears throat> well, no, because all of the code that's in there right now is still using the sum function because it's using the hash. It's not using the name, it's using the hash of that immutable bit of code. And so it will continue to run forever because that's all it is. Couple of benefits. Not only do we have this reliability issue, we get rid of package managers. They're no longer necessary. How, do you, code, update, how do you update the function? Ah, so what happens is, okay, so they actually have a, um, uh, a tool that you're using to, uh, it, it's kind of like, it's actually kind of cool. It's like a process that sits there and monitors your editor. And when you make changes to functions and save them, it will, it will import them into its own local copy of the code. And from there, you can use this tool. It's like it's almost like having a Git workspace, right? So mm -hmm. the code goes into it, and then you can tell it, okay, now commit this code. And at the same time, you will be, um, if you're using code from the, the global cloud, it will be bringing this code down. It will tell you if this code has an update. And... Uh, the environment has the ability to uh, effectively cherry pick in a Git sense to merge in those changes if you want to. So you can say, okay, the sum function has changed. Show me what's different. And it will show you the before and after. And then you could say, oh, yes, I want that change. Or, oh, no, I don't want that change. If you want that change, it will change the hash associated with your use of the word sum. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you'll get it. If you, if you don't want the change, then your code will be, uh, when you next pick that code out, that function will no longer be called sum. It will mm -hmm. be called something else to reflect the hash of the original function. Um, so it's, it's really kind of cool. Anybody who's ever written any JavaScript knows that if you take a one-year-old project and check out a Git and try and actually build it, the chances are about 50-50, it won't work. Yeah, mm -hmm. This fixes that because yeah. all of the code is immutable. So therefore, you know exactly what code you're using today, but also 10 years from now. Yeah, um, it, It's a really attractive idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's also really quite scary to use because this idea, I mean, you sit there with an editor buffer, you enter code, then you delete it, and you enter some more code and you delete it and you enter more, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. do I trust it this much? You know, but <laughs> you know, again, same as small talk. Yeah. Except unlike small talk, the image is automatically global. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to do all this, you know, export out and load it back in again stuff. It just, it's there. So, it's, so, so, I, so, so, so when I, I, I was, I, I said earlier, I was, I was looking at some of your stuff, before we started talking, and what one of the blog posts that was on your site that I read was was about where does state live, mm. and is that not slightly at odds with what you're saying about immutability? Because it seemed in that blog post you were talking yeah, what it, sounded more to me about you know, like an OO style of it is, putting it state close to the behaviour. Yeah, exactly, and that is, uh, I think that is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Proof. That you should never listen to what I say. Uh, <laughs> no, I think that, be, better going back to you've got a guess out clause because earlier you said you said really it's all about context. Well, it's it's <laughs> about context, but it's also about learning and it's about yeah. it's about experience. And I think I came late to the functional party, mm -hmm. partly because I was really enjoying the fringes of prototype based OO. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was initially with Ruby, uh, then with JavaScript. I was having a blast just messing around with that. And so it took me a while to invest in the functional stuff. And I think, yeah, I I looking back, I think I would still go along with what I said, but it doesn't apply to me anymore. So, so one one of the other things that that you that you've been talking about is is the idea of algebraic effects. Is is that one of so so one of the things that you know the the, the, the difficulty with pure functional systems is that at some point you want you know 
you state. need to be able to change state. <laughs> right. you, you need to be able to change state. <laughs> you know, right. you need, stuff needs to change. So absolutely. So it okay. So algebraic effects are. It is state, but it's it's state in a very very general sense, almost an academic mm -hmm. sense. Um. So there are two current kind of ways that people do things that that tie into this. Uh, one of them is exceptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at some point in your code, you define an exception handler. And inside that handler, you have a block of code. And if any exception is thrown as a result of executing that block of code, then it will come back to your handler. And it doesn't matter if it's 16 levels deep in the call stack, it will still come back to your handler. Okay. That is a relatively unique kind of scoping. You know, we're mm -hmm. all familiar with, with like module level, global, and local to a function scope or to a block scope. But here we have scope that is only determined at runtime. Yeah. Uh, it's called dynamic scoping. Now, there were some languages that had that. Uh, Perl is probably the most commonly known example. But if you've done any bash scripting, then it's got the same concept. Dynamic scope means that the scope is worked out from the call stack. Okay. Part two, if you've ever written a program that has configuration, then you know the pain of how do I get the configuration to everybody that needs to use it? Yeah. Or I have a logger. How do I get access to the logger to every single piece of code in here? You know, and I mean, <laughs> The temptation is to make those things global, or mm -hmm. you know, we'll we'll pretend that we're being good and we're not making it global. We're making it a singleton, but yeah, that's global, right? Um, and then what happens if, for a particular chunk of code, we want to change that? So, for example, for all of my application, I'll have a particular logger, but for this calculation of you know the bank balance, it's so critical that I want to switch loggers and duplicate my logging both to the normal logger, but also to the, the money logger or whatever it might be. Yeah, How yeah. am I going to do that? Uh, particularly as the calculation involves calling other functions and they call other functions. And how do I stop myself having like parameter hell passing, you know, 17 different parameters just to get all of the state I need out through this. So what, uh, the algebraic effect folks say is we're going to give you a facility that looks a little bit like exceptions mm -hmm. where the you set up a block of code or really you set up a function and you decorate that function with a handler and during the execution of the code in that function either in it directly or through its call stack that other code can invoke functions in the handler. They don't have to know what the handler was. It just obeys a certain interface. So it could be a, a logging handler, and maybe it's got a, a dot .info function or something. So any code in this stack will know that it can it, it's wrapped in a logger, and therefore it can call dot .info without having to mm -hmm. pass it down as a parameter. And when it calls dot info, we search back up the stack to find the first function that actually has a logger decoration when we use that. So that's how we could handle the kind of dependency injection side of adding functionality data down a call stack without actually having to pass those parameters. That on its own, to my mind, is a massive win. But then it, it, it reminds uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So this, but there's another aspect to it, which is even more exciting. Um, and that is the idea that what would happen if you write an exception, a, a, a fun block of code with an exception handler, you go into the catch clause and you look at that and say, oh, that's okay. Um, let's carry on running and I'll give you this value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from the code that raised the exception, you know, it just keeps going with some value that was passed to it by the exception handler. And all of the stack gets unwound and wound back up again, and everything magically happens. 
Um, now, if you could do that, then what you've got is a function at the top level that's being called arbitrarily deep by anybody that wants to, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if we arrange for that function to be a reducer, what it means is it's got a state and it's got the current value that is being passed and it's going to return an updated state to itself and a new uh, the value that the code that calls it sees mm -hmm. all right so i could write something which is basically like a monadic do block in haskell in that every potentially any function call that invokes my um, decorator code is going to go into a function that already knows state I can it can update that state and then return the state back to itself in a loop. Effectively, it's it's a recursive loop. Yeah. And so it's going to manage state while at the same time doing stuff from my code and level steep. So and, so so just just to help just to help people picture that, right. can you give an example of of using that facility? Okay. Um, turtle graphics. Okay, I want to do turtle graphics. So. I write a decorator, which is uh, SVG Turtle Graphics, and I wrap a function uh, or I decorate a function with SVG Turtle Graphics. And SVG Turtle Graphics implements the Turtle Graphics interface. So there'll be, you know, left, right, a pen up, pen down. Yeah. Now, any, any function, any code, within the call scope of the function I just decorated can start drawing. It can just mm -hmm. call left, right, up, down. And every time it calls one of those functions, it's going to come back into my decorator. The decorator is going to have existing state, which is just managed by the runtime. And it's going to know that I just called up, for example. So it's going to check that state. It's going to modify the pen state to be up and then return the pen state so return the updated state back to itself. And it's also, imagine that our up call, or imagine that all of our turtle calls return the current location of the turtle. Mm -hmm. So it can return back to the person that called up the current location the turtle is. And so I could just write up, you know, left, down, left, left, straight, whatever. And the turtle state is just going to be updated automatically. Now, instead of using uh, SVG, I am going to uh, draw it on, uh, I don't know, a graphics display of some kind. So I just have to replace my SVG total graphics with, you know, SWT total graphics or whatever else it might be. And it just works. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's a very, very powerful way of, of injecting behavior in a type safe way. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I, I, I'm I'm missing something here, but but it sounds similar to me in some ways to aspect oriented programming. I, I did a little bit of that a while ago, and right. that always made me slightly nervous. In, in yeah, and and this is making me slightly nervous for for similar reasons. So what, one of the things that that we adopted on the team where we were using that as a technique was that we we eventually decided that we were going to, we'd use that for kind of, you know, um, the accidental complexity of the system, but try not to put essential complexity in those, in the aspects kind of thing, because it, it started getting too complicated to reason about what was going on where. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, in the same way that in a functional program, you want to keep the vast vast majority of the code purely functional yeah and you only want to drop down into the monadic state when you have to i mean quite a few functional programs just have the do loop at the top and that's it um so i i agree with that as a as a um as a strategy mm -hmm. uh in general whenever you're talking about stateful things the smaller the box you keep it in the easier it is to think about yeah. Um, however, I think there's a fair, and I don't know aspect J, which I assume is what you're using, mm -hmm. but um, certainly many of the AOP systems that I saw coming up were 
kind of like using a fancy macro processor. Mm -hmm. And they would modify the code kind of blindly. Um, one of the benefits of algebraic effects is it's kind of like the difference between a text-based macro system, like, for example, C's, mm -hmm. and a AST-based macro system, like Elixir's, in that the AST-based one is hygienic. Right? It's going to obey all of the rules of the language. Yeah. So for Elixir, it obeys like scoping and everything else. Uh, for uh, Unison, the ability thing, which is their version of algebraic effects, is totally type safe. Yeah. Um, and in fact, can be type inferred quite often, which is kind of scary. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're right. It is uh, possible to shoot yourself in the foot with this, mm -hmm. but it's also possible to greatly simplify common patterns. Sure, and, and enormously powerful. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting way of looking at... Um, of, of trying to work out the discipline of separating the transformations from the reductions in your mm -hmm. code, right? Because the more you can transform and the less you can reduce, the the better your code. And so if you if you think about it this way, and what you find yourself doing when you're using these this kind of technique is you find yourself uh First of all, it makes your use of state explicit. Mm -hmm. And so you, you look at the code that uses the state and you go, whoa, I don't need all of that in there, right? And so I'm going to strip this out, this out, and this out and turn those into pure functions that are going to interact with my state you know, via their, their interfaces. And so you actually find yourself, if you use this, drawing a better line between stateful and stateless code. Okay. Um, I mean, I, having said that, this is all based on like three months worth of playing, and I have never written a production app using it. Mm -hmm. um, but I got really excited by this because it yeah. seemed to solve a problem in a very, very elegant way um, and in a way more approachable way than, say, a monad-based approach. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'm looking at the time and I'm conscious that I've been taking a lot of your time today. So we should probably think about wrapping up at this point. The time has just flown by. I've really enjoyed it. I, I've really enjoyed it too. It's been it's been delightful. Maybe we should uh, revisit this at some point in the future and talk more about I, I've got a long list of other things that I wanted to talk to you about <laughs> as well. But uh, this, this has been great. Um, so let me just wrap up and say... Thank you again to, to Dave for being here today and giving us the benefit of his experience and an insight to these things. And certainly from my point of view, pointing me at something that I hadn't come across before, right? Uh, several things that I hadn't come across before. So, so I'm going I'm to be looking into, uh, into this in a little, certainly the algebraic effects things and trying to get my head around that a little bit. Uh, interesting stuff. Um, I'll say thank you, everybody, for watching. And if you enjoyed the content today, please do remember to hit subscribe and like if you enjoyed it. Thank you again and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.